Hello guys, uh, my name is Valerie and we are in Prague, Czech Republic. Today I'm going to take you around uh, the city where I live uh, and show you why so many people love to come here. So we first saw some cobblestones on the ground and that's a very typical feature for a medieval town. Cobblestones made it much, much easier to clean the streets and also for vehicles to move around. Uh, but we will not be just looking at the ground all the time. We came here for the architecture. That's why everybody comes to Prague, because of the architecture. We have every single architectural style here that was invented in the past 1,000 years. How cool is that? Uh, how come? Well, unlike cities like Berlin, Warsaw, and uh, Dresden uh, that were destroyed, bombed during Second World War, Prague managed to stay off the target. So that's uh, why uh, the Prague Historical City Center is under protection of UNESCO and 7 to 10 million people come here to visit it every year. Yeah? So we're going to have a look at some of the houses here. That's that one. Have a look. It's called the House of the Golden Bear. Sorry, two golden bears, actually. If you look up, you will see that there's two of them. And that's a Renaissance house with a house sign. So this uh, two golden bears is a house sign. Uh, they were the predecessors of the normal um, numbers. Uh, a lot of people were illiterate back then, so it was easier for them to orient in the city if they had pictures instead of numbers. So if you were making plans with your friends to go out drinking, you would probably agree to meet next to the house of the golden grape. Let's move a little bit. Here's a car. Well, the Prague Old Town streets were not made for a lot of car traffic, only horses, but a lot of things changed. Okay, it moved, we can go back. Yes, yeah, so you would probably agree to meet next to the house of the golden grape instead of the house number 13, right? Because nobody would know what it was. Um, house of the golden grape is actually a real house that exists in Prague. It used to be a wine bar, very famous one. Even Mozart would go there. We don't have time to uh, show it to you guys right now, but I promise when you are in Prague, we will go there. Let's uh, go back to the house of the two golden bears. That one is a Renaissance house. You can see the portal here. And if we go on the corner, you will also see a Gothic arch. That's the one. That's Renaissance and Gothic together. This Gothic arch means that the house existed already in Middle Ages, which is true to a lot of houses in the old town. But, Let's go and have a look at something more astronomical. Well, here it is. The greatest attraction in Prague. Astronomical clock. It's over there. It's part of the bigger building complex, which is right behind me. It's called Old Town Hall. Prague was always a big trading center and a hub of cultural activity. So we just had to have our own town hall here, like in Brussels or Florence. Uh, except uh, we couldn't uh, purchase it at once, so we had to buy it piece by piece. They started with the house of the lighter color over here. We can come closer. So in 1338, they bought their first house, the town councillors. And then in 1364, they started building this big tower. And finally, in 1410, they installed the famous astronomical clock here. So people from all over Europe started to come here to see the astronomical clock show. And so will we, because the show runs daily from 9 a.m. till 11 p.m. And it's been like that since Middle Ages. So let's see it.
I can almost hear your thoughts. That's it? Well, it might have been more impressive for medieval people, but these were easily impressed. A woman who could brew herbal tea and read books was considered to be a witch. Surely she wasn't so smart by nature, she must have sold her soul to the devil. I would probably be burned at stake for what I'm about to say now. This clock is considered to be second most disappointing attraction in Europe. Oh, I'm still alive. Suck it, Inquisition. So what about the clock? How does it work, right? Uh, we actually have two dials here. Let's start with the bottom one. The bottom one is an agricultural calendar. As we mentioned before, a lot of people were illiterate, so having names of months written in Latin there wouldn't make sense for them. Uh, so we just have 12 beautiful medallions that represent these months. Uh, let's look up. We have a, uh, another dial there. That's actually where the party is at, because that's the dial that shows us different systems of time. Uh, they're pointed at with a, a little golden hand. That's not a euphemism. Um, it actually points at three different numerals. There's medieval numerals. They show us Italian time. That's absolutely useless because their system of time starts with the sunset. That's the first hour, the sunset. Uh, useless uh, right now. But uh, there's also Roman numerals and they show us Germanic time. That's where you should look uh, for the time, but only six out of 12 months of the year because they didn't take into account uh, light savings. Also, there is Arabic numerals and they show us um, Babylonic time or the light hours of the day. What about the name of the clock? It's called astronomical clock. Surely there's, there's got to be something astronomical uh, there. Well, if we look at the center of the dial, we will see what? We will see good old planet Earth there because the clock was built still at the time when people thought that planet Earth is the center of the universe. That didn't age well. Um, the rest of it did though, because we can see also the golden sun there that makes a full circle around the dial in a year long time. And there's also the moon that by the way has a little engine inside of it, so it spins it and you can see the different phases of the moon there. I'm sure all of you also want to see the mechanism that operates the clock. That is hidden behind that metal door all the way at the bottom. But unfortunately, I forgot to take the keys uh, to that door today, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, well, we'll do it someday later. Okay, so we are right now in the middle of the Old Town Square. This is the heart of the city of Prague. And we jokingly call it our biggest open air museum. Because look around, you will see many buildings. They're all different architectural styles. We have Baroque, we have Gothic, we have Renaissance, we have everything here. I'm sure the building that catches your attention is the tallest building on the square. That's uh, a church of Our Lady before Tin complicated, but it can be even more complicated with uh, with Czech names. And that's a church that was built during the reign of Charles IV. Remember this name, guys, because you are going to hear it once again when Václav takes over in the end of uh, our tour. And uh, uh, this church actually has two Gothic towers, but they are not symmetrical. Look at them. One tower is thicker than the other. It would be the right one, actually, which is, uh, which is thicker. And it's not a mistake, they planned it so, because one tower represents Eve, another tower represents Adam. The question is, who is who, right? Well, I'm gonna answer it myself. Uh, the right tower is the Adam Tower, because it's located on the south, so when the sun rises, it casts a shadow at the Tower of Eve, and it shields her from the burning sun kind of romantic, I don't know, maybe. But there's uh, a lot more things on the square, so let's have a look at some more. All right, we also have a statue here. 
This statue is dedicated to a Czech reformer. Um, his name was Jan Hus, and he was uh, kind of like a Czech version of Martin Luther, so really the beginning of uh, Protestantism in Europe. We also have another column here. It's called Marian Column. <laughs> that column was actually reinstalled around two, three months ago. And that is a column uh, kind of connected uh, to a war called 30 Years War. If you studied European history, you probably spent a lot of nights trying to remember all the dates about it because this war is really messy. Uh, one thing straight about it is the name. It really lasted 30 years, so it wasn't like a previous 100 years war or whatnot. And this was a very bloody war, and it actually affected Czech, uh, Czech people a lot. And uh, we could say that it was a war between between uh, Catholic and Protestant population of Europe. Uh, there's another thing that I wanted to show you guys, but it's on the opposite side of the square. So we can have a look there. There's something strange going on there. Uh, we can have a look. There's a man that looks like a builder and he's lying on the ground and he's holding a pipe, it looks like, it's like a pipe. I don't know what that is. <laughs> He's asking if somebody has a lighter. <laughs> That's what you call classy in Czech. <laughs> but what I wanted to show you guys are these crosses right behind him. Well, they're actually connected to quite a serious topic. So I feel a bit weird talking about it now, having this guy chilling there. Okay, and there's also now a guy who's playing an <laughs> instrument and a woman wearing a wedding dress <laughs> around him. I really feel strange right now, but anyway. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, let's continue. Well, guys, you probably saw some crosses on the ground. There's actually 27 of them, and they're connected to the event uh, which happened during 30 years war that I previously mentioned. That was the place where 27 members of Czech uprising against Habsburg rule were executed brutally. First, they cut their heads off, and then they quartered their bodies, and they placed some of these heads on the tower of the Charles Bridge to remind people that they should never ever rebel against Habsburgs ever again. Definitely rated 18. Uh, so let's go check out something else. Uh, it will be Jewish Quarter, so please follow me over there. Hey guys, we are now in the center of the Jewish Quarter where many interesting buildings surround us and a lovely history of the Jews in Prague. Now, to start us with, I need to take you back to the 13th century when in the year 1215, Pope Innocent III declared the Jews culprits for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and since then on they are secluded from societies. And the Prague Jewish ghetto was established all around us. The first important building I have for you is this gorgeous synagogue from 16th century in Renaissance style. It's called the High Synagogue. And the reason why they call it the High Synagogue is because the Jewish prayer room is located on the first floor. Cool, huh? The next building is right next to it. It's the Jewish Town Hall. A gorgeous style of architecture called Rococo is actually one of my favorite ones from 1700s. It is characterized for having pastel colors, as you can see, light blue in this case, and floral decorations. All right? So that was the Jewish town hall. Now, this building. If you can follow me, I consider to be the most important one in the Jewish quarter. But not only that, from here you can have a little bit of a better view. I love this angle because you can really clearly see it. This is called the Old New Synagogue. Built in the year 1270 and what is impressive is that it survived everything that you can possibly imagine. Medieval fires, First and Second World War, Communism, and it's still here and it's still standing. 
Not only that, but it's the oldest synagogue still functioning in Europe. How amazing is that? And it has a legend, my most favorite legend, and it involves the Golem of Prague. For that, if you can follow me, I'll show you the Golem. Okay, so at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, there was a famous rabbi here whose name was Yuda Lau. More famously known to the Jews as Maharal, which means our teacher. So Maharal Yuda Lau, our teacher Yuda Lau. And he's responsible for the creation of this monster, whose name is Golem. In modern Hebrew, Golem means cocoon, the process to butterfly, and the stupid one to refer to the creature from Prague. Okay? Now, he was sick and tired of pogroms. Pogrom in Russian uh, word means destruction. So he goes to Voltava River, he grabs clay and water, he took it all the way up on a hill that nobody had dug there before, okay? Situates it horizontally, and then he goes around it seven times, producing formulas of creation, and he also uses fire, so four elements. When he's about to be done, he grabs Shem, the word of God, and he inserts it in the mouth of Golem. And then he writes on the forehead, Emet, which means truth. With these, he becomes alive, and he was going to be completely controlled by Rabbi Yuda Lau. One day, unfortunately, Rabbi Lau forgot to deactivate Golem, and it was on Sabbath, which is the resting day. It starts on Friday sunset, and it goes to Saturday. The whole, the whole day, they're resting, they are not working. And what happens is, Golem becomes evil. His eyes are red. And, and, and he starts to destroy absolutely everything. He goes to the old new synagogue and he shakes it fiercely, all right? And then the rabbi goes outside, climbs on the shoulders of Golem, removes the ancient scriptures of the, from the mouth of Golem, and he's gonna cross out one letter. So instead of emet, it will read met, which means dead. Collapses as clay and water, he grabs that and he stores it in the attic of the old new synagogue. And ever since, Golem is still there. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, I'll be your guide now. My name is uh, Václav, you can also call me V. And together we will go explore Charles Bridge, all right? So when you come to Prague, uh, we always tell people that visit here that if you want to say you've seen Prague, you have to see three things, okay? That means astronomical clock, Charles Bridge and Prague Castle. On this tour, you're gonna get a taste of two of those, all right? So we can come with me. And uh, you can see here a statue of Charles IV, which is where the name Charles Bridge comes from, okay? So this king that you can see here, he was the most important king from our history. And that's not because I think so, that's because we actually had a TV show in the year 2005 called The Greatest Czech, where people from all around the country voted who is the most important Czech from Czech history. And uh, Charles IV uh, here won, all right? So this was a king and uh, our country in the Middle Ages was called the Kingdom of Bohemia. So he was a king of Bohemia and he was also a Holy Roman Emperor. And he had this great plan that he will make Prague the seat of the Holy Roman Empire and the so-called uh, Holy City Jerusalem, which means uh, he believed that the last judgment will actually take place here. And he wanted to prepare Prague as the city for last judgment, okay? So you can think of him as the greatest urban planner in the history of our country, because he's basically the main reason why people come to Prague today. He built Charles Bridge, the cathedral in the castle. He built over 20 different churches in Prague. Uh, he built here so much that Prague became the third largest city in Europe. It was bigger than London and bigger than Paris even. Imagine that. The only two bigger cities was Rome and Constantinople. Okay, so we have a legend about Charles Bridge and uh, the legend says that uh, Charles, when he started the construction of this bridge, he um, 
will first call his uh, court astronomer or astrologer and he will ask him when should I start the construction of this bridge so it never falls, right? This was not the first bridge that was standing in Prague and all the previous bridges that were here, they actually collapsed because of floods, all right? So Charles wanted to make sure that this one will never collapse, okay? And uh, you can see here behind me these numbers. So this actually is connected to the legend because the astrologer will one day come to him and he will say, if you want this bridge to never fall, we have to start the construction in the year 1357 on the 9th of July on 5 hours and 31 minutes because this is the exact moment the planet Saturn will be in conjunction with Sun a positive rift in the universe will open and it will be just the best time to build it right now it's not only astrological formula but also numerological so if you guys follow the numbers you can see it from right to left from right from left to right it's it's we call it palindrome okay Anyway, so let's go to the bridge. <clears throat> Charles Bridge, this is where you can see it. Uh, Charles Bridge today is uh, mainly special for us because it's uh, the longest medieval stone bridge in Europe. The total length of the bridge is over half kilometer, 517 meters total, and we are gonna cross it together. So let's go. Okay, come on, let's come here. So, as I, as I said guys before, Charles Bridge is one of the most visited places in Prague, which means uh, it gets really crowded. And by real, I mean really crowded. So, we came here very early in the morning, so we can actually, guys, enjoy the bridge, right? Now, um, as we are crossing it, you can see there is 30 different statues decorating the bridge. Uh, these statues were not here originally when Charles IV built it. Uh, they were added about 300 years later, in 1600s. Uh, to explain why, it's a bit complicated, but uh, let's just say that we Czech people had a lot of problems with uh, religion in our country, and uh, we had a lot of wars between Protestants and Catholics, okay? And in 1600s, there was one war, which you might know the name, it was called 30 Years' War in Europe, and we lost this war. We were originally Protestant, but then we were for forced to be 100% Catholic, and uh, it was after this war that they started to decorate the bridge with these statues. So they celebrate Catholic Church, basically. And uh, we will now go show you one of the most important statues. Uh, we are almost done with uh, crossing the Charles Bridge. And our next stop is going to be the most important statue on Charles Bridge. And that's the statue of St. John of Nepomuk, which you can see over here. All right. Now, you can notice, by the way, the color. So uh, the statue is green because it's made out of bronze, while all the other statues here are made out of sandstone. So it's just a little bit different material. But that's not why we are here to talk about the material. Um, let's take a look over here. So at the bottom of the statue, you can see two reliefs. Um, the pictures there are telling you the story of or the legend of uh, the life of John of Nepomuk, right? So on this picture, uh, you can see here a queen on her knees and she is confessing her sins. The man she's confessing her sins to, that's John of Nepomuk, right? So the legend says that one day the, she will confess that she cheated on the king, or at least that's what the king thought so. And uh, the king Wenceslas IV, which was, by the way, son of Charles IV, our most important king, uh, he will call the priest to his chamber. He will demand that he wants to know the secrets from the confessions of his wife. But of course, this guy had to keep it secret since he was a priest. And uh, so the king got very angry, beat him up. They kick him too hard in his head and John will die. Well. He was not just a regular priest, he was what we would call the general vicar of the archbishop, which was one of the highest functions of Catholic Church in this country. So they had to hide it. And, uh, you know, you can see it on the second picture over here, where they basically brought the body of John to Charles Bridge. So this is Charles Bridge. And you can see a bunch of guards here, and they are throwing him off the bridge to the water, hoping that nobody will discover John ever again, except for the fishermen did. They caught him in a fishing, fishing net, they pulled him to the riverbank, and the legend says they look at his uh, 
face as it was still in the water, floating the body, and uh, they saw a reflection of the night sky, and around his head five bright shining golden stars appeared. And it was taken as a miracle, and John of Nepomuk will become a saint. And uh, today you can recognize him. If you look at the head of the statue, you can actually see it has a halo made out of five golden stars, and that's because of the legend, right? So why do people, why are, why are these reliefs shining like this? It's because uh, people come here to touch the statue, and uh, there is a general belief uh, that if you touch the statue and you make a wish, your wish will come true within one year and one day, if you keep it secret, like John did. So that's the most difficult part, but you know, that's up to you. Anyways, so right now, uh, John of Nepomuk, he is buried, if you take a look over there, he is buried in Prague Castle, which uh, according to Guinness Book of Records, guys, is the largest castle complex in the world. The total area that the castle encompasses is 45 hectares, so it's about 45 soccer fields for your imagination. So we are talking the gardens, the castle, all of that is 45 soccer fields. And uh, he's buried in the cathedral, in the castle. His tombstone is made out of hundreds of kilograms of silver. So maybe something to consider to visit on your next visit of Prague. And thank you guys for watching this video. And I hope you enjoyed the tour. And uh, one day in the future, we'll hopefully see you here. Thank <laughs> you.